This week on ANN, Pastor Lamech Gwadashinga is released from a prison in Burundi. ADRA helps women and children amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. And the new digital Bible study connects people who are worshiping at home. These stories and more coming up. Thank you so much for joining us this week. First in the news, the East Central Africa Division, or ECD, is pleased to inform Adventist church members and the public that Pastor Limek Barishinga was released from the Bujumbura Central Prison in Burundi on February 10th, 2021. Barishinga is an Adventist pastor in Burundi. On October the 24th of 2019, he was arrested and jailed for his faith. Since then, the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists has mobilized members all over the world to pray for him and the whole church in Burundi. The East Central Africa Division is grateful to God and thanks both the government and those around the world who have prayed, making this day of celebration possible. East Central Africa Division President Blasius Buguri said, I would like to thank God for protecting his servant. He has answered our prayers. I also wish to acknowledge the efforts of our brethren in ECD and around the world who joined us in this journey of prayer. Looking forward to more blessings and mission, Ruguri urged the church in Burundi to make Philippians 1-6 their motto, being confident in this, that he who began the good work in you will carry it to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. President of the Seventh-day Adventist World Church, Ted M.C. Wilson, offered his gratitude for Burishinga's release. We are so thankful to God and the Burundi government for the release of Lamech Burishinga, for whom we have been praying for many months, said Wilson. We praise the Lord for this good development towards a normalization of Seventh-day Adventist church activities in Burundi, so the three angels' messages can go with increased power throughout Burundi in anticipation of Christ's soon coming. The Adventist Development and Relief Agency, or ADRA, in Ecuador has provided food assistance to more than 16,500 vulnerable families in COVID-19 affected provinces in Ecuador. Pregnant women, lactating moms, and families with children under five years of age received food stamps redeemable through a chain of supermarkets in the South American country. Country director for ADRA Ecuador said, since the beginning of the pandemic, ADRA has mobilized resources in Ecuador and pledged its solidarity to provide food assistance to thousands of affected families. Thanks to the support of the World Food Program and the United States Agency for International Development, we have continued to improving the nutrition of children and their families through healthy and nutritious food, the dissemination of education, and prevention messages. The assistance came at a time when families needed it most. I express my gratitude to God to our donors and to the entire ADRA team for allowing us to fulfill this mission. ADRA launched the project through funding assistance from the World Food Program and USAID. ADRA has established alliances with trusted partners to deliver monetary cash transfers through nutritional support vouchers to families in need in Ecuador and other communities around the world. Beneficiary families from the Ecuadorian communities of Pichincha, Manabi, Los Rios, Gallagas, Gaias, excuse me, and Santa Elena received a redeemable food coupon valued at Antes de la pandemia todo era normal, cada quien tenía su, su vida rutinaria de trabajo. Normalmente vendía mi agüita, vendía la casa, para que... Yo trabajaba, eh, era tutora de un niño con autismo en una escuela. Fue muy duro porque había momentos que yo no tenía para la comida. Todo muy mal porque todos los locales cerraron, entonces no teníamos a quién vender. Fue mucho más duro para nosotros porque días día teníamos para darles de comer a los bebés y días no teníamos que darles de comer. Bien difícil eh, y más que todo eh, embarazada.
Eh, vivo bien contenta con mi sonrisa grandota. Una alegría. No, no sé cómo explicarlo, sinceramente. Una emoción porque no había tenido nunca una oportunidad así de coger tantas cosas. Muy feliz, contenta porque podía hacer las compritas que nunca había comprado así, la verdad. Se me puso el cuerpo que hasta quería llorar. Fue algo que me llegó un momento muy inesperado. Yo me quería ir a comprar ya. <risa> Yo les agradezco de todo corazón por habernos ayudado a todas las familias que estamos más necesitadas. Estoy muy agradecida con estas organizaciones porque han sido de gran ayuda. Con no agradecerles al Programa Mundial de Alimentos, a USAID y a ADRA por esta ayuda que, que nos ha llegado en este tiempo tan difícil. De verdad yo les agradezco de todo corazón por esa ayuda que me ha servido muchísimo para mi familia, para mis hijitos. Gracias. 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 Muchísimas gracias. A new resource from Adventist Information Ministry, or AIM, the Evangelistic Contact Center of the North American Division and Adventist Learning Community, or ALC, provides an opportunity for those longing for fellowship and Bible study during the coronavirus pandemic. A Picture of God offers 16 free, online, easy to navigate lessons that build on each other to reveal God's character to seekers. Visitors can select a self-guided or collaborative lesson plan. The collaborative selection comes with the ability to connect with an online or in-person spiritual mentor who is a member of AIM's digital evangelism team. Collaborative users also receive feedback and encouragement after each lesson. A team member is also on call for self-guided users if they have questions throughout their studies. Currently, there are 277 people enrolled in a self-guided study and 52 in the collaborative study. 31 people have been connected with a local or online church and eight have accepted Jesus as their personal savior, one of whom has been in contact with the church in Oregon for baptism. In addition, many have reached out with questions or prayer requests. AIM's digital evangelism team also partners with the General Conference to connect international visitors to local churches in their regions. Director of ALC Adam Fenner says that the experience was made for anyone who was interested in learning about God. The groundwork for the study was laid by Keith Bauman II, who at the time was Associate Director of Pastoral Professional Development for ALC. Bowman wrote the lessons, which were peer-reviewed by staff of the North American Division, General Conference and the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary at Andrews University. Plans are underway to build more specific Bible studies on topics including health, marriage, relationships, and stress. You can learn more at apictureofgod.com. When Lily Pimentel, a third-year student at Montemorelos University in North Mexico, had to stay home in Chiapas, Mexico, and do distance learning early last year, she and her family noticed a great need in her community. Many families impacted by the financial strain of the pandemic and a lack of resources in the internet at home didn't have the ability to continue online schooling for their children. So Pimentel and her family came up with a project to tutor school-age children in their home. They even set apart a special room to teach the children. Chapa's educational administration system reported that at the beginning of the 2020-2021 year, more than 36,000 students at the basic and upper educational levels were not registered in the system, which represents school dropouts among students in the state. Only 24.6% of homes in Chapa's have internet access. The Inter-American Division sent this report about how an Adventist family became tutors during the pandemic. Can I 
podido ir a la escuela. Chiapas no estaba preparado para una modalidad virtual. Que el internet no está en todo el estado de Chiapas. Bueno, la, la idea empieza cuando empieza precisamente la pandemia. Nos quedamos en casa y entonces eh, estuvimos allí por la ventana viendo y vimos a unos niños que andaban allí jugando y empecé a pensar qué se podía hacer con ellos y entonces sacamos una conclusión de que lo que podíamos hacer era traerlos a este lugar para poder enseñarles a leer y a escribir. Hace exactamente más de cinco meses, eh, mi esposo me comentó y me dijo, ¿por qué no enseñamos a los hijos de los vecinitos a leer? Porque pues se están atrasando, no están yendo a la escuela y tampoco están tomando clases en línea, porque son personas de casos recursos. Hemos atendido hasta seis, siete niños, ¿verdad?, en este proyecto que hemos fundado. Yo ayudo en ese proyecto a mis papás, ellos comenzaron durante ese periodo de pandemia el proyecto. La verdad creo que ha sido de gran impacto para los niños porque ellos vienen muy emocionados a los proyectos a cada sábado que se realiza. Tenemos eh, primero la sección de medios donde ven películas, pues les ponemos algunos cantos. Los niños se divierten mucho en esta sección de medios. También tenemos otra sección que es la sección de lectura. Entonces en la sección de lectura ellos pueden leer alguna historia. También es muy divertido para ellos estar aprendiendo a leer. Y la siguiente sección es la que más disfrutan, es la sección de juegos. En ella les ponemos algunas actividades en las que ellos pueden participar y pues allí aprenden las vocales también, porque dicen que también se aprende jugando. Así que ahí les ponemos actividades en las que ponen en práctica pues este, las vocales y también eh, el aprender a contar, porque pues ellos no sabían contar, pero en los juegos ellos han aprendido más a contar. Bueno, una de las estrategias que nosotros estamos utilizando ya después de que hemos pasado los niveles que ya fueron mencionados, pues este, les damos una, un, una, este, pues un regalito donde ellos se van contentos a casa y, y con eso, ¿verdad? Con esa motivación que les hacemos, quieren volver nuevamente a estas reuniones que nosotros hacemos. La visión para este, de este proyecto a futuro es que este, ellos puedan eh, adquirir más conocimiento y cuando regresen a sus escuelas ya presencialmente ellos vayan más capacitados en el conocimiento que han recibido en este proyecto. Nosotros tomamos medidas, hacemos uso del cubrebocas siempre que estamos con ellos con la finalidad de que, ok, estamos trabajando de manera presencial con un grupo pequeño de niños, pero es claro, tomando siempre las medidas necesarias. Les pedimos a ellos también que, que lleguen, que usen el cubrebocas y si no usan el cubrebocas ellos no pueden entrar a nuestra escuelita. Entonces también así fomentamos lo que es la salud. Chiapas no estaba preparado para una modalidad virtual. Pero nosotros estamos preparados para servir e implementar este tipo de proyectos de educación. Coming up, Adventist Community Services continues their work in New York City. But up next, Advent Health shares how they're approving hospital operations. Welcome back. Avent Health's Central Florida Division opened Mission Control, the largest command center of its kind in 2019, to monitor and improve hospital operations. Today, the unique center is also helping the hospital system manage the COVID-19 pandemic. Tom Johnson reports. 
Hi everyone, I'm Tom Johnson. This week we are coming to you from inside Advent Health's High Tech Mission Control Command Center. It is the heart of our clinical operations, monitoring everything that is happening in our hospitals in real time. It helps keep clinical operations running smoothly, and now it plays a very important role in our COVID-19 response. If an Advent Health ambulance rolls, flight one flies, a patient is rushed into one of our emergency rooms or is moved to a different room. Hi, Dr. Wynn, how can I help you? Mission Control tracks it. I always think of what we can do better. Dr. Sanjay Patani oversees the operation. Mission Control has eyes on every patient in our acute care setting portal of entry. This really is an incredibly high-tech facility. It uses artificial intelligence to not only track what's happening in our hospitals right now in real time, but also to look at what is likely to happen in the coming hours and days. It allowed us to accommodate and to flex like we never have before. And now all that predictive power and tracking tenacity plays a major part in our pandemic response facilitating, among other things, patient transfers between ICUs and keeping eyes on our ventilators. Tracked every patient, every ventilator, every stat. Um, and now we're able to reflect back on all the data that we have and improve our performance. Dr. Patani says Mission Control also now tracks home monitoring when COVID patients are released and will probably branch into vaccinations, public health and population health tracking. Always looking to evolve in how it functions and serves uh, at the whim of the current need. Right now, Mission Control covers seven of our hospitals, but work is happening to expand that coverage to the entire Central Florida Division. Mission Control is a game changer. In Orlando, Tom Johnson for Advent Health. The Adventist Community Services, or ACS, relationship with nonprofit organization City Harvest in New York City expired on January 31, but the work is continuing at another level. ACS leaders say the group is now connected with FEMA, or the Federal Emergency Management Agency, because of the City Harvest partnership. Director of ACS Disaster Response for the North American Division, W. Derek Lee, said the federal government has offered to support City Harvest through a special program, enabling them to select partners they are confident can handle distributing 25 pallets or a tractor trailer load of food each week. City Harvest chose ACS because of its ability to disperse the goods they've received each Monday for the past nine months. The purchase of a freezer in September 2020 has expanded the ACS warehouse's ability to serve the community. In addition to receiving produce, this new agreement adds refrigerated, frozen, and non-perishable items until the end of April 2021 with the possibility of extension. Lee believes the continued delivery of food is positioning ACS to reach communities during some of the most challenging times we have ever seen. Lee added, our hope and plans call for us to continue being a resource for those we come in contact with and seeing all the help and support we receive each week is an amazing thing. In an effort to continue expanding mission outreach to different people groups across the territory, the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Inter-America recently equipped more than 700 of its church leaders, administrators, pastors, and mission coordinators with resources to build bridges with our Muslim friends. The first of its kind event, coined as the Adventist Muslim Relations Training Symposium, sought to provide new knowledge, skills, and attitudes as mission leaders engage in dialogue with their Muslim neighbors and colleagues. The six-day virtual symposium on Islamic studies began on January 11 and ended with a certification ceremony on February the 1st of 2021. More intentional efforts are underway to connect with the nearly half a million Muslims in more than 20 countries and islands in the territory. Director for the Global Center for Adventist Muslim Relations at the Adventist World Headquarters, Petrus Bahadur, was one of the keynote presenters during the training. He applauded the IAG leadership for the initiative and congratulated the hundreds who completed the 20 hours of training. 
The next step in cross-cultural outreach is for church leaders to establish an Adventist mission board in each of the 24 unions in the IED territory. The board will assess the needs of the people groups, facilitate daily dialogues, establish unique women's ministries, identify neutral places for worship, and extend an invitation for a special one-week dialogue program scheduled in January 2022. Coming up, Ashley Chisholm is here with This Week in Adventist History. But up next, Adventist Mission shares a story about a young boy in Kyrgyzstan. Why is there evil in the world? Are Christians hypocrites? Is the Bible a fairy tale? Does Jesus love everyone? Church doesn't feel relevant to my life. Is God even real? You have questions? Let's talk about it. I Believe Bible. Welcome back. A young boy in Kyrgyzstan saw a story about someone who surprised people with gifts. Jared thought it was a great idea and gathered his friends to surprise people with presents. Adventist Mission has one. One day, 13-year-old Jared read a story about a boy named Wilford who liked to surprise people with gifts. He wrapped up gifts, tied them to a rope, and lowered them over people's walls. Then he ran and hid. Jared thought it would be fun to do the same thing in his home of Takmak, Kyrgyzstan. He asked his mom for permission to put gifts in old tissue boxes. What kind of gifts? she asked. Some toys and whatever else I can find. Jared said. His mom liked the idea. Jared and his younger brother Sam had cars and Legos that they had brought along when their family moved from Argentina to serve as volunteers in Kyrgyzstan. Many neighborhood boys were poor and didn't have toys. Jared told a school friend, Camille, about the plan. Let's put some toys in boxes and throw them over walls, he said. Camille grinned in excitement. He thought it was a great idea, and he wanted to help, even though he didn't have any toys to give away. The boys took two tissue boxes and filled them with Legos, toy cars, scarves, and bars of soap. Getting on their bikes, they rode to Camille's neighborhood and chose two houses at random. Jared hurled the first box over one fence, and Camille threw his over the other fence. Quickly, the boys pedaled away. At Jared's house, they laughed as they imagined the surprise of the children who had received the gifts. Sam, Jared's brother, overheard the laughter. Can I join you next time? He asked. A few days later, the three boys got together to prepare more gifts. They invited another boy from school, Kozenbeck, to join them. The boys filled two shoe boxes, two empty tissue boxes, and two plastic bags with a variety of toys, scarves, and soap. Loading the boxes on their bikes, they set off in search of unsuspecting homes. After a few minutes, Jared saw a house surrounded by a fence. The yard was filled with trees. Sam, he said, throw your bag into that yard. Sam tossed the bag over the fence and it landed in the lower branches of a tree. Quick, do something, Sam squealed. Camille was the tallest, so he leaped over the fence. Reaching up into the branches, he grabbed the bag and dropped it on the grass. Let's go before anyone sees us, he shouted. The boys raced away on their bikes. After throwing four more gifts over fences, the boys had one box left. Jared spotted a house with a large metal gate. Quick, push the gift under the gate, he told Kozenbeck. As soon as Kozenbeck pushed the box under the gate, Someone yelled, why are you putting garbage in my yard? As the boys quickly rode away, they heard the voice suddenly exclaim from behind the gate, this isn't garbage, it's a gift. During family worship that evening, Jared and Sam excitedly told their parents about what had happened. Their dad was pleased. He led the family in prayer for all the people who had received the gifts. Jared and Sam are still throwing surprise boxes over people's fences. No one knows that they are responsible, and that's how they want it. And 
other mission stories online by visiting AdventistMission.org. Then click on the videos at the top. And finally, for today's episode, let's turn to Ashley Chisholm for a look at Adventist history. This week, we'll hear about the lives and ministry of Erwin and Mildred Kossenstein. Welcome to This Week in Adventist History. We take a look at the lives of Erwin and Mildred Cosentine, Adventist educators. On February 15, 1917, Erwin Cosentine and Mildred Parker were married. Erwin had been born in the U.S. state of Minnesota on August 23, 1896, and Mildred in the state of New York on February 19, 1896. After their marriage, the Cosentines attended South Lancaster Junior College, a predecessor of Atlantic Union College, Erwin finished the ministerial course and Mildred the advanced normal course in 1920. While raising their three children, Robert, Ruth, and Verna, the Cosentines lived first in New York and Georgia before Erwin received a call to New Zealand. The family moved across the world as in 1928, Erwin became president of Australasian Missionary College, now Avondale University College. Unfortunately, Mildred grew ill with tuberculosis, spending time in a sanitarium there. Her health required the Constantines to return to the United States in 1930, where Irwin took up the presidency of Southern California Junior College. Under his leadership, the school became an accredited institution named La Sierra College, now University. From 1942 to 1946, the Constantines lived in Nebraska, where Irwin was president of Union College. In 1946, however, the Constantines moved to Maryland, where Irwin became secretary and today what would be the director of the General Conference's Education Department, overseeing the global educational work of the Adventist Church. When the Cosentines retired, they made their home in Loma Linda, California, where they remained active in their local communities. Mildred died October 31st, 1983, and Irwin died less than four months later on February 20th, 1984, only five days after their 67th wedding anniversary. You can find out more about the Constantines in the article about Irwin on encyclopedia.adventist.org. And that was this week in Adventist history. Thanks for watching, Anna. Uh, join us next week for more news from the headquarters of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Did you know the Adventist Church has a YouTube channel where you can watch a &N video, a &N in depth and plenty other amazing videos on prophecy, health and Bible study? That's right. Just go to YouTube and search for The Adventist Church. Make sure you click the subscribe button to make sure you're caught up each week. And remember, leave a comment or prayer request. We have people praying for you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Now, before we say goodbye, here's some good news from the book of Habakkuk, chapter 1, verse 12. The passage says, Lord, are you not from everlasting? My God, my Holy One, you will never die. You, Lord, have appointed them to execute judgment. You, my rock, have ordained them to punish. Amen. That's our program for this week. And remember, you can always visit Adventist.news for daily news and videos. Until next time, God bless. Take care.